Hi guys, welcome back to Exmo Lex. From time to time, I like to peruse through the Mormon books at Deseret Industries or DI, which is a Mormon owned thrift store. And yes, there is a section in the book area dedicated to Mormon books. And pretty often I come across an old Mormon book that is full of absolute nonsense. For example, this book, Mormon Doctrine by Bruce R. McConkie. It has some extremely racist teachings. I talk about it a lot on my TikTok, so if you don't follow me there, it's at Exmolex. A few weeks ago, I picked up this little number called What of the Mormons? A Brief Study of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And it's actually written by Gordon B. Hinckley, but it was published in 1947, so years before he became the prophet. Now, importantly, it was published directly by the church. Often when I point out flaws in books like this, Mormons immediately jump to, well, it wasn't published by the church. I mean, it was written by an apostle or a prophet, but it wasn't published by the church, so it's not endorsed by the church and it doesn't count. This one does count, whether they like it or not. It was written by a future prophet and it was published by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I read through this book and marked a few things of interest to share with you all. So this book basically goes over what the church is, where it came from, what it's like, what the history was like. Like, etc. So right off the bat, I noticed something strange. When discussing the question, who are the Mormons? It says, what of the Mormon clergy? It is to say the least very unusual by present day standards. There is no paid ministry. 26 general officers and presidents of missions are given living allowances. Let's talk about this. We know that the higher ups in the church receive this so-called living allowance. I don't know what the amount would have been back in the 40s, but we know as of 2014, they were receiving $120,000 a year, six figures. And back then, perhaps it was 26 men, but as of 2014, it was 89 of them. And I know they like to call this amount a living allowance, but my God. That's not just a living allowance. That's a lot of money to the average person. In fact, it's close to twice as much as the U.S. median household income. In my opinion, it's disingenuous to say there is no paid clergy and then say, but they receive a living allowance of $120,000 a year. And by the way, I was a member of the church for 25 years and I never heard anything about anyone receiving any sort of compensation until I was at least 23. I was taught my whole life that no one was paid, no one got anything, it was all volunteer time with no pay. So moving forward, another interesting thing I noticed, uh, like I mentioned, Gordon B. Hinckley wrote this book. So he talks about how Mormons believe in a progression from life here on this earth, gaining intelligence, the resurrection, basically moving forward into the beyond and always progressing and learning. He then writes, life is purposeful, life is progressive, it leads to godhood. Now, if you watch all my videos, you'll know why Gordon B. Hinckley saying this is especially funny. And just so everyone understands the full context, Gordon B. Hinckley was interviewed for Time Magazine in the late 90s. The interviewer asked, just another related question that comes up is the statements in the King Follett discourse by the prophet about that God the Father was once a man as we were. This is something that Christian writers are always addressing. Is this the teaching of the church today that God the Father was once a man like we are? Hinckley says, I don't know that we teach it. I don't know that we emphasize it. I haven't heard it discussed for a long time in public discourse. I don't know. I don't know all the circumstances under which that statement was made. I understand the philosophical background behind it, but I don't know a lot about it. And I don't know that others know a lot about it. And like I've stated in a previous video, Hinckley talked about this doctrine before the Time Magazine interview. He knows about it. And here again, he proved that he knows about it. I don't think that Gordon B. Hinckley was a stupid, forgetful man. Most of the people in the church know about the idea that God was once a man and then he became a God and we can all progress to the same thing. He just wanted to downplay it for the interview because it sounds insane and he didn't want to promote like a bad image or a weird or insane image for the church. Just interesting to note. So when talking about the priesthood, the book talks about how the church should be governed. He says, there shall not be compulsion nor autocracy. Those who stand in positions of leadership shall act in a spirit of love, persuading but not forcing, without hypocrisy and without guile. I thought this was of note. The church can't physically force anyone to do anything, but that doesn't mean they're not compelled to do things. Force isn't always physical. When you're indoctrinated to believe something that is incredibly important to you, you feel as though you have to do certain things. For example, as an adult, nobody physically forces you to pay your tithing, but they do teach that if you don't pay your tithing, you don't qualify to go to the temple. If you don't go to the temple, you don't qualify to go to the celestial kingdom. And if you don't go to the celestial kingdom, you don't qualify to be with your family forever. 
So basically, with your eternal family on the line, it doesn't really feel like you have a choice. The book also goes over polygamy briefly without mentioning Joseph Smith's involvement at all. Who's surprised? But I actually was surprised by one little tidbit. It talks about how polygamy was a commandment from God and the saints had to obey, which, okay. But then it talks about how polygamy in the church came to an end, and it straight up says they had to end the practice because the United States government prohibited it. It became illegal. I found this super interesting because I was always taught that it didn't have anything to do with the laws because God was above such laws. I was always taught that they stopped practicing polygamy because God decided that the saints didn't need to practice polygamy anymore. I never heard the whole deal about the illegality of it. So I asked my Twitter followers about what they were taught about it. And right now, that poll is at 76% were also taught that polygamy ended because God commanded it to end. But like I said, this book was written in the 40s, so was the church more open about it back then? Today, if you go to the church's website and look under Gospel Topics essays, you'll find that they tell the truth about it now. But that's not what I was taught in my day. I was never taught that it was outlawed. I was just taught that God ended it the same way God started it. So... In the comments, let me know, what were you taught about why the church stopped practicing polygamy? Very soon after talking about polygamy, he moves on to talking about the sanctity of marriage. And of course, it's emphasized that Mormons believe that adultery or sexual sin is literally next to murder in gravity, according to Mormon theology, which is just a wonderful thing to promote. Love that. Later on in the book, it talks about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And it may or may not surprise you to hear that seer stones are not mentioned at all. The only reference to what is used for the translation is the Urim and Thummim. I didn't hear anything about the seer stones until at least like 2017, so I'm not surprised. It's not exactly faith-promoting to let everyone know that Joseph Smith used a rock and a hat to translate the Book of Mormon, especially when it was the same rock that he used to con people out of money when he was in the midst of his treasure-digging business. Another tidbit that may or may not surprise you, personally, I'm past being surprised about this kind of thing when it comes to the church. The book directly says that the Lamanites of the Book of Mormon are today's Native Americans. Quote, the remnant of the Lamanite nation is today found among the American Indians. There's also this awful picture of a mural that is in the Mesa, Arizona temple. I'll put it up on screen so you can see. The picture is captioned, Joseph Smith tells a group of natives the story of their progenitors as found in the Book of Mormon. Of course, back in the 40s, the church didn't know that DNA evidence would one day prove this wrong. They used to print in the intro to the Book of Mormon that the Lamanites were the principal ancestors of the American Indians. After DNA evidence, they've backed up on that quite a bit, but they still put in the intro to the Book of Mormon that the Lamanites are among the ancestors of the American Indians. Fast forward a bit here in the book and we get to talking about Joseph Smith ordering a printing press to be destroyed. So first, I'll tell you about what actually happened, and then I'll tell you what the book says happened. The newspaper was founded by some disaffected associates of Joseph Smith, and it published only one issue. These men were very unhappy with Joseph. Several of them claimed that Joseph had tried to seduce their wives into plural marriage, which, again, who's surprised? So they printed in the paper that Joseph Smith had once been a true prophet but was now a fallen prophet. They talked about the introduction of polygamy and several other controversial doctrines being the cause. They also printed that as the church president and the mayor and a person who had tried to run for president of the United States, that Joseph Smith had too much power and was trying to start a theocracy. And that Joseph Smith was corrupting young women by forcing them or coercing them into plural marriage with him. Now, all of this is true, except perhaps that Joseph Smith was ever a true prophet in the first place. Remember, he said and told women that an angel with a sword had threatened his life if he didn't obey the commandment of polygamy. So the paper wanted to expose Joseph Smith as a fraud and let everyone know what he was doing. Joseph Smith, obviously, wasn't happy about this and ordered the printing press to be destroyed. And here's what the book says happened. Six men had been disfellowshipped from the church, so they decided to ruin Joseph Smith. They printed a libelous sheet called the Nauvoo Expositor. Remember, something is only libelous if it's not true, but whatever. And then Joseph Smith, the mayor, ordered the printing press to be destroyed. That's basically it. It paints Joseph Smith and his followers as victims of hatred and violence, and it doesn't give any of the reasons why people were angry with them, besides saying that a few disfellowshipped people were mad about being disfellowshipped. Oh, and a few were mad because Joseph Smith was running for president and they didn't like the policies he proposed. It mentions nothing of polygamy, nothing of Joseph coercing teenagers into marriage, nothing of seducing other men's wives. Ugh. 
towards the very end of the book, polygamy is revisited. It mentions that the doctrine of polygamy was introduced by Joseph Smith in 1842 and that those close to him accepted it, but it was not publicly taught until 1852. However, with the information we have now, it appears that Joseph Smith had already married six women and or girls prior to 1842. And it doesn't mention that Joseph Smith participated in polygamy at all. It goes on to say, quote, indications point to the fact that as a rule, the children of polygamous marriages were superior physically and mentally. And that is one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. Is the answer to producing smarter, stronger people that we should have children in polygamous marriages? What the fuck? So, there you have it. A book written by future prophet Gordon B. Hinckley and published by the church itself. Several falsehoods and a lot of lying by omission. I hope you enjoyed. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you so much to all my patrons for supporting my channel. You guys are amazing. Special thank you to at Kegar, Craig Call, Jake Nunyabiz, and Melissa Jane Heyer for supporting at the Demon Tier on my Patreon. If you would like to support the channel or find me on my other social media, you can find links for that in the description below. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!